Hey, happy Friday. Thanks for joining me. I'm Carla with Race to Walk, and it's time for our weekly Bible study. And today we are going to be going over Job chapter 22 and Eliaphaz's third and last response to Job. But before we get started, a little bit about this channel. Here we share good thoughts about good words. And on Fridays, I host a live Bible study on Instagram at Race to Walk, and then I publish two videos a week. A video about books and a replay of the survival study and sometimes I do an, an interview or another little short clip um, so if you are interested in those things then um, just subscribe and like the video and keep an eye out for upcoming videos we are in the book of Job we are now officially halfway through so there are 42 chapters last week when we finished it we were officially halfway through and on the downward slope. And if you'd like to see all the Bible studies I've done, you can go to my website at racetowalk.org forward slash Bible dash studies. And I have a list of all the Bible series that I've done. There's a page for the book of Job and you can see the entire list and get up to date or catch any of the ones that you've missed. There's also a written version of the Bible study as well as an audio version if you just like um, like a podcast and just be able to listen to it. So about that and this week, um, I'm not even sure what the deal is. I don't know if anybody's noticed this, but I have actually started writing out my entire Bible studies before I do them. And so hopefully you can tell a little bit of a difference and it's been going a little bit smooth, more smoothly. Um, and I did do that this week. However, I don't know what's going on with my computer. It just like, started freezing up and I couldn't even get to it. It was hanging. So I do have that written out. There will be, when I post this Bible study, there will be a written post. But as for, it might be a little different because I'm not going to be going through what I've written. I'm just going to be reading from the, the Bible. So it won't like sync totally from the written version and what I'm doing. Uh, because we're just going to go old school and use the Bible because I could not get Scrivener to start where I had written it up. So anyway, I don't know what's going on. There must have been a Windows update. And then to add to that, I actually had to get a new phone because I have been using a Blackberry all this time. And they're supposed to have a new one coming out. And it's not yet. And so literally I had like... Two of the little caps were coming off of my BlackBerry, and I had to replace the battery a couple months ago. It started smoking. I guess that's what happens with lithium batteries or something. And then it started, like, doing these weird shaking things, and the screen wasn't responding. And I was like, okay, I just got, I got to give it up. So, anyway, hopefully you can tell the difference in the quality. Hopefully the sound's better on this. So I was having a lot of problems, just to be honest with you, with the BlackBerry and Instagram Live. So the audio cloud. There's always like, I always had to do a lot with it to try to make it sound a little bit better. So hopefully it is, hopefully it is, but that's a little drama coming into this Bible study. But before we get started, let's just start this time with a prayer. Lord, we thank you so much for this time and for this day. And I rebuke every single thing that raises itself up against the knowledge of you. I plead the blood of Jesus over each person that listens. And I ask, Lord, that you give us eyes that can see you clearly. Give us ears that can hear your voice. And give us a heart that is willing to seek after you. And we thank you, Lord, for your Holy Spirit. And we invite in the presence of your Holy Spirit to be our teacher and our guide. In Jesus' name, amen. Okay, so... This is Job 22, Eliphaz's third and last response to Job, and we went over in the beginning, one of the first Bible studies, um, that the book of Job is actually in a chiastic structure, and so there's like a pairing starting from like the first and the last and going into the center, and so last week was, I feel like, kind of a nugget of the, pers the purpose of the writer of the book of Job that there was um, a judgment against, you know, the powerful that think that there's they're not going to be held to account. And personally, I believe that regardless of anything else, that that was one of the, the intents of the, what the writer was trying to say. But just going through what the friends had been saying to Job in this series of dialogues, um, we have looked at that Eliphaz is, um, he, he's convinced that Job has 
uh, experienced all this loss because of some sort of personal sin. Bildad believed that it was like something to do with his family and Zophar thought it had to do with something with his business dealings and endeavors. And Eliphaz, in the very beginning, is thinking that um, he's pretty positive this is what's going on because he's had this supernatural sort of revelation and that has told him this. And so he doesn't question the source of it. And in that initial Bible study, we discussed like how the signs, uh, some of the red flags that uh, it was not the revelation that he had wasn't of the Holy Spirit, that it was demonically inspired, but he's certain of it. And then in his second response, he's offended because Job isn't listening to him. So he talks a little bit about that. And now he's in his last response. So Job has responded, just responded to Zophar. It's Eliaphaz's turn right now. And so we're going to get, we're just going to start in with verse one. Then Eliaphaz the Tamanite answered, is it to God that a strong man is of benefit? Is it to him that it even a wise man is profitable? Is it of any benefit to the Almighty that you should be righteous? Or is it any gain to him that you make your ways blameless? So here's the thing. I'm reading from the Net Study Bible. I actually, when I was, this is a side note. When I was writing it out, I was getting the Net Translation, but I was getting it off of Bible Gateway, and it's not quite the same. So again, this is going to be a little bit different if, if you read it, because I'm it's just slightly different. But one of the things about this is that, again, like what we looked at was that, um, you know, the friends aren't all wrong. A lot of the things of what they say is true, right? It's just that it's not true about Job. And Eliphaz makes a good point here. He points out that, is it of any benefit to God if you, if you're righteous? And that's how the other translation comes across a little bit more. It's like you get, this is like the, uh, the strong, or if a wise man is pros profitable, the other translation comes across more as, um, you know, is it, if your good works, is it any benefit to him? And, and this is true. Is it, God is all sufficient. He is not going to be any better off or any more perfect or any more powerful because of our actions. And so we're not doing things to benefit him. Right. It really, when it comes down to it, it's just an acknowledgement of what he's done for us. So he's saying, is it any, is it any gain to him if you're righteous? And it's not right. It isn't. Verse four, is it because of your piety that he rebukes you and goes to judgment with you? Is not your wickedness great? And is there no end to your iniquity? So what Je life has is saying is that, is God just coming after you because, you know, he's jealous of you and wants to bring you down a peg, which is just a completely absurd thing, right? Because God is perfectly righteous and perfectly just. He treats people fairly. He rewards us as we deserve. But I think what we see here a little bit is Eliaphaz's motivation. And I do think that there's some jealousy here. Eliaphaz, you know, came, he thought he was going to console Job Turns out that Job isn't interested in what he has to say. And I think Eliaphaz was offended by that. And so I think that this is showing some of Eliaphaz's motivations here. Okay. And then we're going to go down into verse 6. If you took... Now, this is, this is the thing. This is what he's saying that he thinks that Job has done. So again, Eliaphaz thinks that Job has done something personally that has brought his calamity on him, like he got what he deserved. So it wasn't true in Job's case, but we've we've talked about this a couple of times. We've talked about identificational repentance. And when we do things, when we personally do things that are wrong, that's our own personal sin. But if those sins aren't repented of, then that can, in some cases, lead to judgment against our descendants against our generations and that's called and it's not only that it can be things that were associated or affiliated with it's called identificational repentance and you see this over and over again throughout the bible where someone 
who is not, they're affiliated with, but they're, they haven't personally done the wrong, but they're interceding on the part of this, um, this group they're a part of, whether it's a people, whether it's a nation, whether it's a family, right? And pr pleading, they're confessing their sin and asking God for forgiveness. You see that all the way through the Exodus when Moses is interceding on the path, behalf of the Israelites. You see that in the time of the judges where they've done something wrong, something happens and they have to go back and basically make reparations for what happened generations ago. And we also talked about the fact that the Day of Atonement, that was a corporate repentance, that it has nothing to do with individual sins. The Day of Atonement is to atone for unconfessed sins on the part of, the, so that the nation was covered. Okay, so this is identificational repentance in its very essence. So anyway, so we talk about that. So when I read these next passages, Listen to it and ask yourself, okay, we know it's not true of Job, but is this true in my case? Have I done this? Or has anyone in my family done this? Because if someone that you know in your generations has done this, then guess what? You know what? You could be under judgment for that if it's never been repented of and confessed. I know it's controversial, but this is actually, this is absolutely true. So again, I will link to this book. This isn't the only one. It's just the most recent one I, I've read about it. Um, it's a book called Origins. I'm gonna, and uh, I'll link to it. It, it just, she, But she talks about this. And there's there's a lot of other books out there that, that do. But anyway, we talked about that. I think it was last week. Okay, so what can bring judgment? Like what, what does Eliphaz think would be an action worthy of all the disasters that Job experienced? For you took pledges from your brothers for no reason, and you stripped the clothing from the naked. You gave the weary no water to drink, and from the hungry you withheld food. Although you were a powerful man, owning land, an honored man living in it, you sent widows away empty-handed, and the arms of the orphans you crushed. This is why snares surround you, and why sudden fear terrifies you, why it is so dark you cannot see, and why a flood of waters covers you. So what is Job saying here? He's saying you exploited someone in need. He took, uh, you know, somebody needed money. They lent, you lent it to them, but you exploited the situation. You, what was the next thing? It was you stripped the clothing from the naked. So you took the last little bit of what someone had, right? And you gave the weary no water to drink, and from the hungry you withheld food. So, ignoring someone in need, and that's the same thing that happens in the next um, the next verse. You sent widows away empty-handed, and the arms of the orphans you crushed. So, not helping, not only not helping the weak and the powerless that had no one to stand for them, but actually making their situation worse. And Eliphaz is saying, this is why you're experiencing what you're experiencing. So a lot of times, you know, I think like in the U.S., there's this um, underlying idea that ethics and morality doesn't apply to business. That when it comes to money, it's just amoral. And like whatever you can do in whatever you get is, you know, as long as you can get away with it, it makes it right. And that's not true. If you look, actually read the Bible and just think about, not just read words and, but really think about what is, what is God saying here? There's a whole lot of time spent in the Bible talking about money and business dealings. When you look at the Levitical laws and how you know, the guidance God gave the Israelites to operate when they came into their own land, there was a whole lot of guidance on business dealings and interactions with other people, how even money and lending. And, um, you know, we talked, I can't remember when this was, this is one of the Bible studies, we talked about the Jubilee system and that how um, even, even without you, they couldn't, uh, there was like a whole welfare system built into it. Um, anyone that 
that had fields, which was basically the resource owners, had to leave a portion of it for the poor and the foreigners in the land. Um, and so they could come and glean. They were supposed to do that. They had these tithes that were supposed to go to the temple. And then the, the Levites were to give some of that to people in need. They were to lend to anybody who needed it. And they weren't to charge interest to the people, to fellow citizens. Um, all debts were to be were to be uh, forgiven within seven years. And the land, which is not like a direct correlation of wealth because you can accumulate wealth without having land, but really when it comes down to it, the land that you own is really enabling you to use these resources, right? And so the land was allocated to the tribes when they entered the land based on population. So it was all equal. And every, the Jubilee system, every 50 years, regardless of who sold what, it was all to go back to those original owners. And so when you look at that, that's really like creating a system where it's almost impossible for the type of situation that we have today, where you have huge amounts of resources in the hands of very few, right? Like less than 1% uh, controls how much. There was a, a reset every 50 years. When you look at the judgment of the Israelites, sometimes it had to do with false worship, but a lot of times it had to do with, uh, there, I mean, there's whole things about how they were supposed to, you know, uh, use the land, like they weren't supposed to like take every little bat last bit from it. And there was just a whole, a whole lot of like, uh, guidance on, um, how they were to operate. So part of it was like when they, they were, went into exile, part of it was because they weren't giving the land its rest. They weren't observing the Sabbath year. But then when you start reading into the minor prophets, you see that there was a whole lot, a whole lot of, um, judgment against Israelites because they were doing exactly what Eliphaz is saying here. They're oppressing the, the poor. They were exploiting the widows and orphans. They were, you know, again, everything that Eliphaz is saying, go and read in the, in the prophets. And they, they give this judgment against the Israelites saying, this is what you've done. And this is why, you know, judgment is falling on you. They're basically saying the same thing that Eliphaz is saying. And so I've actually heard people say that, oh, well, that's the Old Testament. You know, we don't listen to that anymore. You know, does that, that you are applying Old Testament law today? Here's the thing. God doesn't change. You know, he said, I'm the same yesterday, today, and forever. He also doesn't show any favorites, right? So if God gave the Israelites guidelines on how to operate in their culture at the time, what we need to be asked, the specific things may not be applying to to us personally today, but we need to be asking ourselves, what was the point? What was God's point here? Because God didn't stop talking about money, did he? You go and listen to what Jesus said. He said that it's easier for a camel to go through an eye of a needle than for a rich man to enter the kingdom of heaven. Why is that? Because the rich people put put trust in their money and, and into, in themselves rather than in God. And if they do, they're there's no path to salvation for them if that's where they put their trust. Because who are we supposed to put our trust in? We're supposed to be putting our trust in Jesus. You know, you think about Ananias and Sapphira, it's a story in Acts, they were in the early church. And everyone, this is the thing, they were thinking the second coming was coming almost immediately, right? They, they were looking for it daily. And so everybody sold everything that they had and they put it basically was kind of like a commune. They were, you know, they, no one owned anything. They sold everything and they put their money, pulled their money in. And so Ananias and Sapphira went and, uh, they sold a field and they donated the money, but they kept some back for themselves. And so they were asked, is this the price that you got? And he said, yes, this is ask Ananias first. And he dropped dead. It was Pierce. Like you, you didn't have to give the money. You didn't have to, but you, 
you said that you did. So you're lying. You're not lying to us. You're lying to the Holy Spirit. You were free to do with with your field and with the money, whatever you wanted. But you wanted to act like you were something that you weren't. And so the the judgment for that was he dropped dead, dragged his body out. His wife came in. They asked her the same thing. She gave the same response and she dropped dead. And it said the whole, there was fear through the whole church and they realized, you know, the the magnitude and the importance of actually living a life of truth, right? So let me ask you this question. If the Holy Spirit were as present in the church today as it was in that the first days of the church in Jerusalem, that this, the spirit of truth was so, so physically present that a lie about a business dealing would, would cause somebody to drop dead. How many people would we have still standing in the church today? I have a feeling that the pews would be pretty thinned out. But the thing is, that should tell us that this um, integrity with our interactions and how we deal with what we have with our money and with our resources shouldn't be less than what it was in the Old Testament. If we have the spirit of truth within us, if we have um, are led by God's righteousness, then we should have a higher standard than the Old Testament did, right? Not less, we should be higher. We should be led in everything that we do, including our money. But for some reason, you know, a lot of people today think that it doesn't, it doesn't apply. So the other part of it is that Eliphaz alludes to is that often like the rich and powerful think that they're law unto themselves, that they make the rule and that whatever they do is right. And this isn't just Eliphaz spitballing here. There have actually been studies on consumer behavior that have found the exact thing. And I will link to it in the article that I have on my website on this study. But uh, that's what they found, that the more money somebody makes, the more that they think that they have a right to their own rules. They think that their might, as in terms of wealth, actually makes them right, regardless of what their actions are. This is literally true. Okay, so we're going to go a little bit further in this, and this is in uh, chapter, this is verse 12. Is not God on high in heaven? And see the lofty stars and how high they are. But you have said, what does God know? Does he judge through such deep darkness? Thick clouds are a veil for him so he does not see us as he goes back and forth in the vault of heaven. So what Eliphaz is saying is that, you know, the rich and the powerful think that God doesn't know what's going on, that they can do whatever they want, and that they won't be judged. And, you know, there's um, other verses say that too, you know, that, you know, people think the fool says is in his heart, there is no God and thinks that he won't be called to account. But again, that's not true. Verse 15, will you keep to the old path that evil men have walked, men who were carried off before their time when the flood was poured out on their foundations? So this is, he's referring to the flood, right? Men, they were saying to God, turn away from us, and what can the Almighty do to us? But it was he who filled their houses with good things, yet the counsel of the wicked was far from me. The righteous see their destruction and rejoice. The innocent mock them scornfully, saying, surely our enemies are destroyed, and fire consumes their wealth. Let's go on to verse 21. Reconcile yourself with God. And be at peace with him. In this way, your prosperity will be good. Accept instructions from his mouth and store up his words in your heart. If you return to the Almighty, you will be built up. If you remove wicked behavior far from your tent and throw your gold in the dust and your gold of, your gold of Ophir among the rocks and the ravines, then the Almighty himself will be your gold and the choicest silver for you. 
Surely then you will delight yourself in the Almighty and will lift up your face toward God. You will pray to him and he will hear you and you will fulfill your vows to him. Whatever you decide on a matter, it will be established for you and light will shine on your ways. When people are brought low and you say, lift them up, th and then he will save the downcast. He will deliver even someone who is not innocent, who will escape through the cleanness of your hands. When we look at the responses of the friends, so much of it is true, right? They just don't understand that there's some other things going on in Job's situation that it was not true of him. He had not done anything wrong. And he's saying this, this um, advice of Eliphaz is actually exactly what we should be doing. It's like, reconcile yourself with God. This is what he, Eliphaz is saying. He's saying, repent, repent of this and accept God's instructions. So we have to recognize that our way is not the right way and repent and humble ourselves before God. That is absolutely true. And he's saying, if you remove this wickedness from your temple and don't put your trust in, in money, that the Almighty himself will be their tre his treasure. And that's true, right? That is true. And this is what he's saying. If you turn back to God and you put your trust in God, rather than in the gold and in, in your treasures and what you have, so whatever you decide on a matter, it will be established for you. And that God will hear their prayers, right? Jesus said the same thing, right? He said, do not lay up for yourselves treasures on earth where moth and rust consume and where thieves break in and steal. And that's Matthew 6.15, right? That's, that's what Eliphaz is saying. So it's not that he doesn't have good advice. He just doesn't have the whole picture. And what Eliphaz is saying here is actually very similar to the same words of Micah. So Micah is a prophet. He's telling the Israelites, you know, what they've done to deserve judgment. And this is in the beginning of verse uh, chapter two. Woe to those who divide wickedness and work evil on their beds. When the morning dawns, they perform it because it is in the power of their hand right? They can, so they do. They covet fields and seize them and houses and take them away. They oppress a man and his house, a man and his inheritance. Okay, the same thing, same thing Eliphaz is saying. Therefore, thus says the Lord, behold, against this family I am devising evil, from which you cannot remove your necks and you shall not walk haughtily, for it will be an evil time. In that day they shall take up a taunt song against you and wall with bitter lament and say we are utterly ruined he changes the portion of my people how he removes it from me so this is the thing they they had their portion that god had given them and their you know the people in power the rich and the, the powerful were taking that that god had given to them among our captors, he divides our fields. Therefore, you will have none to cast the line by lot in the assembly of the Lord. Do not preach, thus they preach. One should not preach of these things. Disgrace will not overtake us. It's like, don't say that, right? Should we? Should this be said, O house of Jacob, is the spirit of the Lord impatient? Are these his doings? Do not my words do good to him who walks uprightly? This is exactly what Eliphaz is saying. But you rise against my people as an enemy. You strip the robe from the peaceful, from those who pass by trustingly with no thought of war. The women of my people you drive out from their pleasant houses, from their young children you take away my glory forever. This is exactly what is saying what Eliphaz is saying that is, you know, cause of judgment by pressing the widows and the orphans, right? Arise and go, for for this is no place to rest, because of your uncleanness that destroys with a grievous destruction. If a man should go about and utter wind and lies, saying, I will preach to you of wine and strong drink, he would be the preacher for this people. I will surely gather all of you, O Jacob. I will gather the remnant of Israel. I will set them together like a sheep in a fold, like a flock in its pasture, a noisy multitude of men, 
He who opens the breach will go up before them. They will break through and pass the gate going out. Their king will pass on before them. The Lord at their head. So Micah has just told them that they're pretty much a bunch of degenerates. And, you know, he's saying that uh, if a man should go about and utter words, wind and lies, saying, I will preach you wine and strong drink, that would be a preacher for this people. It's like, that's what you're interested in. You're a bunch of hedonists. The Israelites have been told that there will be judgment, that they're going to be going into exile and losing the land that God has given them. But this is the end, right? This is, you know, this is one of the things about prophecy that there's, he doesn't give a judgment without a promise of hope at the end, right? Because God is our redeemer and deliverer. So I will surely gather you, O Jacob. I will gather the remnant of Israel. I will set them together like sheep in a fold. I mean, how did Jesus refer to himself as the good shepherd, right? Like a flock in his pasture, a noisy multitude of men, he who opens the breach will go up before them. They will break through and pass through the gate, going out by it. The king will pass on before them, the Lord at their head. So... Micah is promising that the Lord himself will be the shepherd of Israel, the leader and the guide, right? But we see that in chapter 2, that he's saying the exact same thing that Eliphaz is saying. The same thing that Eliphaz is saying will bring judgment. Micah is telling the Israelites that, that is, this is what they have done, and that is why judgment is falling. But Eliphaz is also giving the remedy. And I think this is interesting because we talked about in Bildad's... Um, Bill Dad's all of his his dialogue so far, they're really kind of prophetic. He's just what he's saying is that um, God will vindicate you if you're righteous, right? And so Bill Dad had told J uh, Job that his latter days would be greater than his former. That was true, and this is what Eliphaz is saying, which again is. It's in a way prophetic, and this is very true, that Job is vindicated because he is righteous before God, because he has submitted himself and humbled himself before God, because he had not put his trust in his wealth. And all the way through this, we've seen that Job has come from a place of fearing God, fearing the supernatural generally, and really getting to know his Redeemer and his Savior, the one in who he could put his trust, right? So let's read this last, this last part. Whatever you decide on a matter, it will be established for you and light will shine on your ways. When people are brought low and you say, lift them up, then he will save the downcast. So not only will Job be redeemed, but he's saying that even, even those that he intercedes for and prays for will be, and he will deliver someone even who is not innocent, who will escape through the cleanness of your hands. And this is really a description of the truly righteous one, right? So Job, even though he was he was right before God, he, he did humble himself before God. He was not a perfect person. He was he still needed a savior. And he said this in Job chapter 19, for I know that my redeemer lives, right? What Eliphaz is saying here is exactly how Jesus was able to be our Redeemer because he is truly the righteous one. When we are brought low, then Jesus can redeem us because he's right before God and he can pray for and intercede for us and, and deliver us even though we on our own don't deliver that. So even though Eliphaz is kind of speaking this as a judgment, he's also being uh, prophetic in that he is explaining this way of salvation, that this truly righteous person who is Jesus could make a way and intercede for us. He's explaining that. So anyway, that is our lesson for day of Job 22, and we're going to be going to his response in 23 and 24 next week. So um, let me know your thoughts. It, it's interesting how even though when he doesn't have a right understanding, he still speaks truth, right? 
So anyway, again, you can go and see all of the Bible studies, see the replay on racewalk.org forward slash Bible dash studies. You can see the whole thing. Um, if you'd like to support this ministry, you can go to racewalk.org forward slash give. And if you haven't already, make sure you subscribe. Thank you so much for watching this whole Bible study. Let's just end this time with a prayer. Lord, we thank you so much for this time and for this day, Lord. I thank you that you are our good God who has made a way for us to be right and in right relationship with you, Lord. We thank you that Jesus is our Redeemer and our Mediator and the one who is interceding for us at your right hand. I thank you, Lord, that you have good plans for us. And I pray for the favor and blessing of God over each person that listens. In Jesus' name, amen. Well, thanks for watching and I'll see you next time.